<laughs> Thank you. Am I on? Is this working? Yes? Yes. Hello? No. no. Oh, okay. Great. So I'll talk normally. But first, a speaker selfie. Y'all wave. Wave. Great. Thank you. Um, apologies, I'm fighting a little bit of a cold, so I might have to grab a lozenge or some water. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for coming. And thanks to Jason and Will for hosting. Uh, I'm going to run through 14 lessons of the last 22 years of my professional practice. I do call it a practice. Why is that? Any guesses? Why are you practicing design? Like, why does a doctor have a practice? Still always, who, who said that? Always learning. <laughs> always learning. So this is not a portfolio. What's that? Hello, guys. Oh, great. Um, this is not a portfolio presentation. If you want to see my portfolio, you can go to my website, which I'll show at the end of the lecture. I don't like dog and pony shows, and I don't like being lectured to. So thanks for kicking off the dialogue, old guy. I appreciate it. <laughs> So these are some of the most important lessons that I've learned over the last 22 years. Um, and they're here to set you on a successful career path. So for the next 20-ish minutes, I'm going to move pretty swiftly through each and leave lots of time at the end for Q and A, because you've got Qs and I've got As. That's how that works. All right. Boom. Design is never done. There will always be something new to learn a new typeface to try out, a new color, a new device, a new interface, a new problem to solve. <laughs> Lifelong learning, it's true. Okay, lesson number two, optimism rules. You are a designer and you make things that don't exist. That takes optimism. That takes the idea that you can create something and make it so. Nobody likes working with pessimists. It's a bummer when someone's not optimistic. But when you are an optimist, it helps people see the good in themselves. You, you become a mirror for potential and possibility. And if you are reactive, and if you're doing something negatively, that adds to the pessimism. Nobody wants that. That's a closing device, not an opening device. Optimism is an opening device. It creates. It doesn't conclude. I see you all are taking notes. I'll hand these slides to Jason so you can, you can focus on me and I can focus on you. Um, as a partner with your collaborators or clients, your charge is to help manifest something. So that requires you to be optimistic. And believe it or not, it has ROI. Anyone know what that means? Good. Why does being an optimist have return on investment? Based on what I've just said. Anyone? This is a classroom, right? We can have dialogue. Yes. It opens doors. Why is that a good... ROI. Uh, because they can't have opportunities they necessarily have. Yeah. Anyone want to add to that? Anyone want to keep opening that? Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're collaborating with something or someone on a product, and you make that thing together, and you're both proud of it. You both made something together. Exactly. Okay. For me, I learn by doing. I have always learned by doing. There are lots of styles of learning, but for me, I learn by doing. These are some of the things I have designed. I've never designed a house before, but one morning, I woke up with a floor plan in my head, literally emerged from sleep with a design, and I sketched it, and it's an Illustrator file, and I keep adding to it, and at some point, I hope to build it in beautiful California. 
Um, designing teams is kind of neat. That's what I do at Twitter now. I don't actually do any aesthetic work at Twitter. I do the operational work. I help the teams do the design work. I help the teams do the aesthetic work. Out of all these, I want to talk about one of them in particular. I designed a bed. Have I ever designed a bed before? No. But I'm really inspired by Charles and Ray Eames. They designed these chairs. They're pretty classic. They've been around forever. They look pretty modern, even though they're classic. On the left is the side chair, molded plywood side chair. On the right is the lounge chair. Uh, I first encountered the work of Charles and Ray Eames in high school. Um, my science teacher showed us Powers of Ten. Have you all seen it? Not a lot of hands. Okay, amazing opportunity. Watch Powers of Ten, 1976. It's on YouTube. It's uh, a 10 minute video. What's amazing about this film, I should say it's film. They made it in film. What's amazing about this film is that not only was it um, technologically constrained by 1977's standards, but they did so much to show you, the audience, how to think about scale. The concept for Powers of Ten is, it starts with a picnic, and you see one meter of space. That's 10 to the one. And then they, the, the filmmakers, Charles and Ray Eames, zoomed out 10 to the two, it's 100 meters. And they zoom out and out and out by a power of 10, until they're in the limits of outer space, and then they zoom back in into the man's hand, and they show us DNA, and it's, it's mind-blowing. If I had the mind-blowing slide queued up again, I would show it again. To me, I was like, holy fucking shit, who are these people? I wanna know everything about them, and that's when I first encountered these chairs. So, back to the bed. I lived in Providence, Rhode Island for a little while. RISD is a great design school there. Not as great as ASU. <laughs> uh, they've been around for a while, and I found an illustrator, and I said, an illustrator who's also an industrial designer, and I said, here's the kind of bed that I want. I was a terrible client. It's kind of like Charles and Ray Eames' molded plywood chairs, but it sort of warps around, and it bends, and it sort of looks like a, a toboggan, and it sort of slides, and I don't want it to feel like anything other than floating. That was the word that he took to heart. I found a woodworker on Treasure Island in the middle of the San Francisco Bay. I gave him that uh, illustration. He gave me this sketch. That was one round of collaboration. And I was like, that part's kind of, that's seven inches there, that's kind of weird. Like, why is it seven? Because if you go back to the sketch, it's not that deep. The side rail with the three dots, I was like, why is that different? And he said, how big's your mattress? And I said, Good question, it's 14 inches. So in order to create the same kind of effect that I wanted, uh, he molded it so that it would come out like I wanted. And I love this bed. I love sleeping in it. I didn't wipe my floors before I took these pictures, <laughs> so I photoshopped out the dust just for you. Um, that top right corner on the inside is kind of weird, but like this is a prototype. I'm happy to sleep on a prototype every night. I showed, a, I showed these slides to a designer at Twitter two days ago, and I was like, any thoughts? And he's like, I want the bed. <laughs> so we'll probably make another one. But I've never designed a bed before. I learned how to design a bed by designing a bed and by working with somebody who could create the bed. That's how I learned this. The brilliance is in the edit. What, does I, what do I mean by that, anyone? Someone who hasn't spoken, there's a lot of you in this room. Doing refinements. Refinements, why? Why do you say that? Uh, it takes more perception. It takes more perception, oh, I like that. Yeah, you learn by refining, yes.
Okay, great. So I'm going to TLDR. Tell me if I got this right. Essentially, she learned about a client's needs by collaborating and conversation and narrowing down and editing what this client wanted. Um, if a client, this is not in the slides, but if a client comes to you and says, I want a poster and here's what it should say, what's your first response? Why? Why do you want a poster? Why do you want it to say that? And if you ask why again, you'll get to the heart of what I think you're, what you just described, the kind of collaboration before the collaboration, the back and forth that reveals what you're actually trying to solve. Psychiatrists actually call that the presenting problem. Um, I'm sure that other uh, industries use this too, but if you go into a doctor and you say, my right shoulder hurts, some doctors will be like, okay, let's fix your right shoulder. Other doctors might say, oh, I lost you already, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I hope she gets, he or she gets better. Uh-huh, that's okay, you can watch the recording. Um, some doctors will be like, why is it this shoulder and not this shoulder? They'll dig into the problem a little bit more and then they'll realize, okay, your backpack straps are messed up and you're carrying more weight on your right shoulder. That's, that's the presenting problem versus the problem. So ask why a bunch and then you'll get to the real problem. Um, so the brilliance is in the edit to me means that you don't poop something out and it's done. You have to mold that poop. I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> edit that, please. Um, you have to iterate. You have to iterate and iterate and iterate again, and the revision helps you learn what you're actually doing. Showing up is the first part of the process. This is one of my favorite pieces of graphic design in the world. It's a cover of Critique magazine that was published by Marty Neumeyer. It says, winter 2000. Can you take a quote that's about simplification and make it simpler? Oh yes, you can. This is the edit. This is the brilliance of editing. You're all students. You're all here to learn. Who has taken Will's course on failure? I love this. I just learned this this afternoon. Failure is a gift. Failure is data. If you're learning, you can't fail. If you're learning about what it is you could be doing better, like how that poop joke was received by the audience, <laughs> it still works. Um, then you can keep learning about how to give this talk without making poop again. Um, critique and feedback is a gift. You should treat it as such. You should thank the person giving you feedback, even if it hurts. Even if it's like, oh, I wish they didn't comment on my poop jokes. Um, it's something, giving and receiving feedback is also something you can always practice. And if you're experimenting all the time and you treat your work as an experiment, you'll always learn. It kind of takes the pressure off if you treat it like an experiment. I like to cook a lot. I, would, I, I get asked a lot, when am I going to open up a restaurant? And I would never open up a restaurant because I never want to cook the same thing the same way. Because the tomato's always going to be different. The heat of the kitchen's always, the, the oven's going to be a different temperature. That kind of like manufacturing of things does not appeal to me as much as like, oh, what if I add this? What if I sprinkle that? That experimentation for me is like how I learn. And sometimes I'll write it down. It's called a recipe. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you don't know Milton Glaser, you absolutely should. I love this quote. It kind of blew my mind. You can do a lot of research, but sometimes when you come back to the problem and you've identified the problem clearly, the answer's right there. You've all seen this. Milton drew this in the back of a cab on the way to present this. This is a sketch doodle on a napkin, and he didn't give it much thought. But then again, he's Milton Glaser, so he was sort of born with some of these, born this way, born with some of these things. This logo has lasted 35 years, and it has raised $30 million per year for the New York State Economic Development Agency. A sketch, an experiment, 
an idea, a problem that was contained within the problem because the prompt was, we need something for travel and uh, tourism for New York State. It doesn't say New York City purposely, it's just for New York State. And <clears throat> he sketched it and the problem was right there. I made this up. Um, <laughs> I, I dislike it when someone uses a term that I've never heard and it feels like I don't know what the hell they're talking about. Especially if it's an acronym. I don't know what it is about acronyms, but like you can ask what the acronym is and you can ask the person what it is they're trying to say. But if they're sort of like, oh, you've never heard of the ROI or something? Just, it's that asking why again, ask why again, why haven't I heard of the I I don't know, educate me, don't, don't pity me. I want to know, I want to be informed. So if you've ever heard words or terms that are confusing or isolating, you need to ask those questions and not let the opportunity slide by. If you're giving a presentation and you use any of these terms Obviously, so on and so forth, of course, and et cetera, I'm bored. And I don't know what the hell you're talking about. What's obvious to you isn't obvious to you. What's obvious to you isn't obvious to you. Don't use the word obviously. Obviously. <laughs> um, it helps when you are able to, like you said with your client, get to the same place and identify the same problem. And using words or terms that are exclusionary doesn't help. I'm here because Jason and I have networked for years. We've been friends for 10 years. Um, this is 20% of every week. Sometimes 30, sometimes 40, sometimes 50. Still for me. When I graduated college in 1994, I moved to Boston and I joined the AIGA Boston chapter. Its network was the key to my getting a couple of freelance projects and also working in-house at small studios and medium-sized agencies. Uh, I came to Phoenix in 97 for the AIGA leadership retreat. It was the first time I was in Phoenix and I had a great time at the Hyatt. Um, who here is a member of AIGA? Good, I want to see more hands. AIGA is the oldest and largest design organization, not product design, not industrial design. There's lots of other organizations, but AIGA was founded in 1914 by a multidisciplinary group of uh, printers, typographers, paper makers, book binders, jobs that don't exist anymore. Uh, and one of the cool things at their first meeting was that they all had to bring their own chairs um, because it was so uh, new and they had no funding. Um, AIGA has opened so many doors for me in my career. I've hung out with my heroes. I've hung out with Debbie Millman. I've hung out with Stefan Sagmeister. And uh, when I moved to Rhode Island in 2004, there was no chapter. I started the Rhode Island chapter, and that was the first time that there was a non-Boston chapter in New England, and then slowly there were lots of other chapters sprouting up around New England. Now there's like, Boston was number, uh, sorry, uh, Rhode Island was number 45, chapter number 45, um, and now there's like 75 chapters. Speaking of acronyms, AIGA used to stand for American Institute of Graphic Arts, um, which is kind of an outdated term, so now it's just AIGA. Another organization that I've given some time to recently is Startout. Uh, it's for LGBT entrepreneurs. Take a guess, how many new businesses need design? Yeah. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So I married AIGA together with Startout and I came up with this concept called Design Entrepreneurs. It's a little bit of a tongue twister but it's for designer entrepreneurs who are LGBT. So I've seen lots of programs around uh, entrepreneur designers. I've seen lots of programs for LGBT designers, but I wanted a trifecta. I wanted like a magically delicious trifecta. 
So this is something that I came up with because I thought it needed to exist. Um, design and entrepreneurship are parallel practices. Both designers and entrepreneurs go where nobody has gone and make stuff that hasn't existed. We bring forms to things we believe, we bring form to, to things we believe need to exist. And that actually resonates pretty deeply with the LGBT community who always questions the way things are and wants to make things more expressive, more inclusive, more tolerant. So I wanted the LGBT designer and entrepreneur communities to exist and they did. This is me with some panelists in San Francisco at WeWork. On the left, a panel in New York. In the center is Debbie Millman, although you can't see her. Um, some other people I met along the way, and on the right, another panel in San Francisco. We had four um, get-togethers. It was really fun. We got some press coverage. And it was all because I had the time and interest and the passion to make it happen. And because I had a great network from both AIGA and start out communities. In case neither of those organizations interest you, um, networking takes many forms, online and off. These are just some. I googled design meetups within Phoenix. There's like 500 within 25 miles. You guys get your work cut out for yourselves. So, shifting gears a little bit. Selling is better than telling. What's the difference? Anyone? What's, what's selling? Let's talk about selling first. Anyone? Putting something in someone's hands. What did you say? Convincing someone, okay. Selling the idea, okay. What? Creating a need, okay. Good, different opinions. What's telling? I'm gonna walk over here. What's telling? Ordering. What? Ordering. Ordering. Absolutely. What else? Someone Expecting someone to listen. What was? Absolutely. Okay, you guys are on it. I once took a public speaking class, and this is what I was taught. This is what I was told. This is how to frame up a public speak. Uh, sorry, this is how to frame up something for public speaking according to this one class. And it's bullshit. <laughs> it's not a lecture, it's a pitch. It's about the customer. Who said creating need? I think you did. It's about the customer, it's not about you. Features are about you. Benefits are about the customer. Put that in black and white. Telling is the features of your product or service, the fastest car, the best checkout flow. Telling is cold, impersonal, and feels like a lecture. Someone said it over here. When you tell a story, you're listing the facts. By contrast, selling is about the benefits that your product or service conveys to the customer. The fastest car that helps you arrive safely in record time or the best checkout flow to make your purchase experience effortless. You see the difference? I'm gonna go back, because I missed some of my notes. Uh, even a design that is brilliant, timely, and original still needs to be contextualized with some persuasion. A bit of unpacking about some of the design decisions you made inside your head. Okay. Learn multiple languages, I don't mean English and Hebrew, or Pig Latin. I mean, know how to contextualize your work in different contexts. Your designer talking to other designers, of course you wanna talk about the process, of course you're gonna be like, oh sorry, I used of course. Um, as a designer talking to other designers, it will be easy to talk about the process. You'll be able to relate to somebody who understands a design process. Clients will most likely not want to hear that. It depends on the client. It's not true for everything. But clients, depending on how much time they have 
or if they're pressed or if they've been involved in the collaboration, they will want to see the results. They will want to see the business ramifications, not your pretty stuff. You might want to find out what the person you're selling to is motivated by. What are their concerns? What kind of day are they having? Where are, where are they in the project? Is it shipping tomorrow? Is it just starting? What is their life like when you go into that room to do your selling? Along with, of course, and et cetera, and yada, 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 don't say I need. I wonder if you could help me when you're asking for help is a much better invitation to help than I need you to look at this by five o'clock. I wonder when you'll have time to get to this because it's really important for me. Need is just a terrible turnoff, I think. And speaking of selling your design work, a lot of it is not about your beautiful design. Hate to say it. It's the work around the work. It's, a work. it's the work about the work. I took a quick poll on Twitter, and these are the results uh, just about a month ago. What percentage of your work would you say is visual or aesthetic? Less than 25% got the most votes. I was not surprised by this. You can't just poop something out there. I said I wasn't going to do it, but I had to. You can't just poop something out there and expect it to just like be awesome. Even if you're Steve Jobs. That man worked so hard on getting everything just right. Okay, sidebar. Do you know why uh, all the Apple devices say 941 when there's like a screen grab of like what the phone's going to look like? Any guesses? This is, this is a great example of how hard and how like planned everything is. 41 minutes into every presentation was the highlight of the presentation. So he wanted to set your expectation that you should be awake for all of it and that the 41st minute was going to be the pinnacle of the reveal or the, the sales pitch. Cool fun fact. If you take nothing else, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so a lot of the work is about getting the work socialized and prepared to be socialized and who's going to be at this meeting so that they can look at my pretty work um, that I work so hard to do. It's about managing schedules and expectations and writing a meeting agenda so that everyone's clear on what that meeting is going to be about and confirming that people are coming to the meeting and getting the best meeting room for your meeting or for your presentation. Organizational dynamics is a whole world in and of itself. And it is directly related to getting your design work sold and approved and shipped. Shipping in the uh, parlance of, of Silicon Valley is just like out the door, like getting it done. It's like print it, ship it, it's, it's a thing, it's alive. Okay, almost done, stay with me. Soft skills persist. I was chatting with Will and Jason about this and others about this today. What's a soft skill versus a hard skill? Anyone? Soft skills? People skills, yep. Presenting your work, that's a soft skill. Telling a story. Anyone? You have a thought. I can see it. <laughs> What's a soft skill? No, that's a hard skill. Computer skills are hard skills. Being able to write. Being able to write. Yes, writing is a great soft skill. Showing up. What? Asking great questions. That's that is a great question. Showing up on time. Here are. 
here's a, here's a flashback. Okay, before I go on. Um, tools will change, code will change, devices come out every month, device sizes change, operating systems change, aesthetics changes. Soft skills persist. Soft skills will not change. And the more you practice them, the better you'll get. Way back machine, when I was, <laughs> when I was 16, and I wanted a typeface from Koenig's Art Emporium in Danbury, Connecticut, I had to order it and wait two weeks for it to be shipped to Koenig so that I could go pick it up and get my burnisher and rub the type off that I wanted with Letraset. This is Letraset. This is, this is ancient, but so am I. Um, this is how you used to be able to deploy a specific typeface that you wanted. And this is a tool that nobody uses. I love this slide, I love this image because it doesn't exist unless you're like, I don't know, a crafting designer who just wants to get things done more slowly. <laughs> um, here are some, here's a list of soft skills. We've covered a few of these. You are the resident therapist in all of your meetings if you're meeting with non-designers. You are listening, you are taking notes, you are asking questions. You might not share anything aesthetic. You might just like reflect back what you heard and say, I'm hearing that you need a poster. I'm hearing that you love this poster and here's why. That's a, that's a therapeutic device and it takes good listening. If you can practice all of these or any one of these, any combination of these, you'll always have a job. Here are some other things that are persistent. Asking questions that start with, how might we? What if? They're invitations. They're inclusive. And help me understand is so much better than any other kind of thing that you're curious about because it empowers the person who knows to help you. It's so simple, it's a simple trick, but it works. Being a mentor is great. I love that a couple weeks ago I got an email from somebody completely random that said, hi, I'm 17, I'm an at-risk youth. I mean, he didn't say this in his email. <laughs> um, he actually, the, the email and the subject line were kind of amazing. Uh, the subject was like design inquiry and, and the body was, uh, dear Mr. Silverman, are you still receiving uh, mail at Twitter? Question mark. Signed Enzo. And I was like, this is a scam. That was my first thought. I'm, a, I'm kind of a jaded New Yorker on the inside. So I was like, this is a scam. And I almost deleted it. I debated deleting it. I responded, what kind of mail? Like, what, what, what is this? Can you give me more context? Can you help me understand what you're looking for? And he is an at-risk youth who is in um, a Jehovah's Witnesses household and he's gay, and that is not a good match, and he's looking for design education. Could I help him? Would I be interested in like mentoring him and bringing him to Twitter and showing him what the real world is like? You betcha. I was all about it, and he's been sending me portfolio updates, and like I'm going to this, and I'm looking at that. I asked a couple people, some people we met at the Hopscotch Design Conference, like uh, who knows resources in Sacramento, where he's from, and, uh, and I got a couple of referrals, I sent them to him. I'm all about it. It's great, and AIGA is kind of a format for that as well. Um, the more you give back, the more it comes back to you tenfold. Tenfold, if not more. So if you need advice or you need help, look for a mentor and be prepared to be a mentee. <clears throat> this is a huge question right now for my work at Twitter because I'm paying attention to the composition of teams and how teams work across different organizations. Design, product design, brand design, these are all different organizations, different teams. Product design, brand design, marketing design, uh, engineering, data science, and um, product management. So when we get a good team of those seven or six or seven uh, representatives together, I'm 
constantly looking at the dynamics in the room, who's talking, who's being interrupted, um, and asking fundamental questions like, are you a morning person? Or do you, oh, great, okay, I know this about you now. Or do you do your best work at night? Do you prefer to be a prototypical engineer who codes by him or herself at two in the morning? Like, asking how you like to get your work done is a great invitation to collaborate in a really successful way. And if you don't know that about your collaborators or your teammates or your classmates, ask. Do you prefer to have strategy sessions at four o'clock on a Friday? Probably not. Need to find This is a great tweet that is true outside of tech. We're all humans, we all need to collaborate, we all need to get stuff done together. The tech is not the problem. Right now, in our society, we're kind of at a critical status, I don't know if you've noticed. There's some things going on, a couple things this week. Um, nobody is born biased, nobody is born with the knowledge that a is right and B is wrong until they are taught that. So if you think that there's nothing to do as a designer, don't tell me you're bored. There's so much work to do in terms of education, in terms of teaching collaboration and a lot of the soft skills, in terms of teaching empathy, teaching tolerance, teaching youth how to think for themselves, how to do critical analysis and research. There's a lot of work to do. And it wouldn't be a design presentation without a quote from Paul Rand. I know I say this as a designer, but everything is design. If something is frustrating you, if something is not working, redesign it, propose to redesign it, ask who designed it, ask under what conditions it was designed, and figure out if there's a way that you can do it one better. A great source for projects is what's wrong, what challenges you, what frustrates you. And lastly, please don't wait. Get started, time is short. If you have an idea, talk about it. Socialize it. Find people who are upset about the same things you're upset about or and or inspired by the same things you're inspired by. Okay? Promise? <laughs> Great. Uh, let's do Q&A. And then I've got a bonus round of slides for you. Yeah, what, sorry, when, when you ask a question, I might repeat it for the video, but also just please tell me your name and like what you're studying. What is an average day in the office? Um, this may be because I'm an early bird and I love to get to work before everyone else does. I feel like I can get a lot of work done before 10 o'clock. A lot of people show up at Twitter at 10 o'clock, which blows my mind. Um, so an average day is I'll wake up at 5.45, I go to the gym for a little while, I'm at Twitter at 7.30ish, I have breakfast, I have coffee. Uh, I start my day with strategy, big picture stuff, and also start with the hardest thing. If you have like a million things to do on your day, don't put the hardest thing for last because you'll run out of steam. Um, on Tuesdays, I run design critique for the product team. So uh, Tuesday is about the least average day um, because I'm in crits all day, facilitating, taking notes, buying donuts before crits start. That's like when those teams come and present. Exactly. With like their design. Yes, yes, that's when teams come. But uh, Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, um, I start with strategy work. I try and connect as many dots as I can. Uh, I'm occasionally in meetings that seem completely purposeless, but they're only half an hour, so that's not bad. Um, I try and eat lunch on our beautiful roof deck, uh, and then I bike home around 4.30. And then I occasionally do freelance work, or teach, or cook dinner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks. Thank you. Yes. What's your name? Um, my name is Hi. I'm your what? Oh, great. 
Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So I have one question. So now I'm, you know, need a uh, place of certain job. So do you have, you know, like, uh, uh, my question is like how to define a good portfolio? So, you know, what kind of principle you have to perform? The question is, the question is, uh, she's in a job search, how do I define a good portfolio? You're in luck because the next set of bonus round slides are just about that. So pause that and we'll come back to you when we're done with Q&A. Okay. okay. Yeah, in the back. Uh, Josh. Hi, Josh. I'm Josh. Great name. Absolutely. The question is, uh, what was my trajectory between traditional graphic designer and managing creative teams? Um, I have never thought of myself as traditional, so there goes that. Um, and I've never thought of myself as a graphic designer. I, I am a designer. Uh, I've, you saw the thing, hopefully you saw the things that I've designed. Um, some of them are not graphic. Um, my talk was pretty graphic. I can't believe all the stuff I should have, shouldn't have said. Um, I think, I think having more empathy for the designers doing the work has really helped. Um, there's so many different kinds of design now and so many different highly nuanced, highly um, sought after roles. Like I know people who just research icons on Twitter and they make icons on Twitter. I, I love logo work, I love identity work, I've always loved it. Um, but having some empathy for the person who's doing just that, and if not, learning from them is great. I mean, working at Twitter is a huge education for anyone who works there because it's hella diverse. Uh, there's a lot of really talented people there of different ages and backgrounds and spe uh, specialties. Um, and I think 15 years of curating project teams, I didn't really talk about my career trajectory, but I started my first business when I was 24, and uh, it came out of seeing how different kinds of teams work, different how, how in-house and out-of-house teams work. Didn't really love that kind of configuration. Um, my firm was lean before lean was a thing, and I curated project teams, whether we needed two people, whether the client or the problem that needed to be solved needed two or five or 25. We could scale. We were a nimble, flexible network of independence. And so learning from all the people that I was working with and collaborating with hands down um, was the best education that I could have gotten. Um, but uh, to your point, I think you said like lifelong learner. You did. Um, I'm always learning. I'm always really curious about how someone is approaching a problem, why they're approaching it that way, what I could possibly learn from that. and. Um, Marrying that with my desire to teach and talk about some of the ongoing uh, soft skills has, I think, been a natural trajectory for me. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yes, haven't heard from you yet. So the question is, can I tell, can I answer or can I speak to managing teams from different disciplines? I think it's related to Joshua's question about like learning from the people you collaborate with. Um, at Twitter, I mean, the difference between being self-employed and working for someone else is that like I got to choose the teams that I wanted to work with. I got to choose the individuals that I brought into projects. At Twitter, I've had to learn a lot of organizational dynamics, design operations uh, is what I do now, and um, a lot of different kinds of research. I didn't know there were so many different modes, m modalities of research for product design. Um, so I think just being open to learning and being open to um, experimentation uh, is how I continue to curate teams. It's not my role to do that, but I'm sort of naturally doing it. One of the best things that I'm doing at Twitter right now is like making, connect, making connections between teams that don't know each other. I got asked a question from the brand and marketing team. Do I know anyone who could come in and give a talk about UX? This is somebody 
at the brand and marketing teams and said, yes, actually, I know somebody who sits right next to you who has the knowledge you're looking for. And so I guess just getting to the heart of what someone's great at and what their skills are and then being able to like uh, reflect that back when it's time has been phenomenal for, for getting things done at Twitter. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, sure. Yes. Um, the, the failure thing I'm really interested in. It's kind great. of been a theme around some of our other speakers. Yeah. Um, and Will talks about it a lot. I am curious. Me too. About. <laughs> <laughs> I'm curious about, I'm not, I'm not trying to pin you, I'm asking because I think you'd be game for it. But can you tell us about your biggest professional failure? Whoa. And what you learned from it <laughs> and how you did not die? I'm still yeah. Um, I don't have a specific story now, but I do remember, um, it's a great question. Um, I do remember uh, a couple of meetings with one client when I was self-employed that I, I wasn't getting what they were after and I wasn't asking good enough questions to solve the problem. And even though I advised you to ask why five times, I didn't in this instance. Um, and that sucked, because they fired us. Um, but it was a great opportunity to learn. Um, another instance, um, more recently, uh, I guess I can tell the, the first six months at Twitter, I was not happy when I started at Twitter. I really thought I was gonna get fired. Um, I was in a new role. I co-wrote my own job description. They had never had anyone in this role before, so they're like, what do you want to do? And I was like, I don't know, what do you need? And so they, the title was called uh, Design Producer, um, but really what I'm doing is design operations. I help get shit done, I help like, make things happen, but I also like coordinate and orchestrate and take notes and produce, and there's a lot more to it than just uh, execution. So one day, um, last November, I had a weekly, I had a bi-weekly with my manager at the time, and I knew that things were not going well. I uh, didn't, didn't feel like I was in the right place, didn't feel like I was in the right role, was wondering if I should have left IBM, um, which was a tough thing to do. And uh, I also felt it, like I was like stressed a lot. And yoga helps and exercise helps. But go into this bi-weekly, and um, funny thing about a really well-funded company like Twitter is that there are bar carts everywhere. So I'm in my manager's private office, and I sit down, and I'm, I've got some slides to share about my progress reports, and he's like, do you want this job? And I was like, great question, Mike. I have no fucking clue. And I reached for some Talisker, delicious single malt scotch. It's 11 in the morning. <laughs> I had a couple of swigs and I was like, can I get back to you tomorrow? And he's like, yeah, take the afternoon. And I actually got a massage, I had a massage scheduled that evening and I was like, could you maybe fit me in sooner? And I had a massage and the next day, I actually sent him and my manager now a thank you note over email that said, I really appreciate that this is a long-term job. Like maybe my first, six months or so, four or five, six months, have not been as uh, great as you wanted, but I know that there's a lot of work to be done here, and I need to do this work, and I maybe need to like shift what I'm working on and like the priority of things, but um, uh, I'm still at Twitter, <laughs> and I'm, I think that my, my ROI is, is now more visible. Um, it's a crazy culture to be invisible in, because operations is not quite visible. I had to make myself more and more and more and more visible. And in a very ship-centric culture, every week, we celebrate what's shipped this week, what's out, what's in the product, what's happening. Like, and that's part of the product. The product is now, 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 now. Everything's happening now, 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 now. And, uh, and so my work is not on that cadence. My work is quarterly and biannually, like I'm gonna come up with a design education 
lecture sort of like Jason has done for having me here, but I have to produce a calendar and a schedule and I have like 25 people to call, so that's gonna be like Q1 next year. But it took me so long to prove myself and feel like I could be valuable um, that it was almost a great failure, but Talisker and a massage helped a lot. <laughs> That's a great question, and I've actually never shared that story, so thank you for asking and giving me the opportunity. All the way in the back. Could you share some of your best tips for project management? And I was also wondering how you get a team that doesn't know each other to be effective in the past? Great questions. Um, I don't know if you all have heard of Basecamp. It's a great project management tool. It's web-based. It's been around for a long time. Uh, they're independent. I like them. Uh, Jason Fried's an entrepreneur. He started this company. He's actually, he had an agency. They, they built a project management tool for themselves. They decided to say fuck to client work because this tool that they started to sell was doing better than their client services work was. Everything's web-based. You can see when things are due. You can assign uh, roles and responsibilities and dependencies. It's kind of like a most amazing Gantt chart with a lot more to it than that. It's, it's, Slack is trying to compete with them. They're sort of a new player in the space, but Jason Fried, if you don't follow him on Twitter or read his Signal versus Noise blog, I highly recommend it. I also just love like rooting for the little guy, like an entrepreneur who's like done it and succeeded and been self-funded and never taken outside money. All that's great. That's, that adds to the love. Um, to your second question, people who haven't met each other, it's hard if, if people are remote. If, I mean, Twitter has, people in London and uh, Tokyo and New York and Boston and San Francisco headquarters and LA and Seattle. Um, buy annual get togethers in person if possible. Um, I love kicking things off in person. Like starting a thing in person, like you can, you can plan versus uh, on Sky uh, Skype or Hangouts and you can like get things done before you kick something off but if you can kick something off in person, if it's a workshop for a couple days, like, great idea to get together socially, physically, to kick something off. And then you have a little bit of interpersonal dynamics. You have like, oh, they're tall. Oh, they smell. Whatever. Whatever it takes to like get to know the person you're working with or the team you're working with, their preferences, they're vegetarian, they're not vegetarian, whatever. Then you can all go off and like do your work. Um, if possible, I would recommend that. All right, how much time are we, how are we doing on time? 7.20? Should I move on? What? Should I move on to yeah. last round? Okay. Um, hit me up on Twitter, questions that weren't asked, happy to answer. Um, bonus round. Interview and portfolio tips to your question. Your question. Yes, I knew it was here. -ish. Thank you. Um, okay. Some tips. Some. Your portfolio should consist of case studies that include each of these sections. They don't have to be discrete sections, but you should talk about what your opportunity or problem is, your hypotheses around solving this problem, what you have tested, what you have not tested, what experiments you've conducted and what you've learned from these, how you have applied these learnings to your design work, potential solutions if you've gotten that far, what the ideal future state of this ex executed live project might be, and what you did. Nothing is worse than seeing a design portfolio knowing that somebody has only written the copy for the headline. Each of your portfolio pieces should be roughly in this format. It's a, it's a pretty simple flow. It doesn't have to be these words, call them what you will, but make sure that it follows this learning flow. Okay, similarly your resume, which is the TLDR of your portfolio, should have goals and impact. I had these goals, this is what I did. I worked at Twitter, I didn't die. <laughs> I didn't explode. Do not name your resume file resume.pdf <laughs> because if I've received more than one, yours will get written over by the next one. Call your resume, your name, the month, 
and the year. I learned this at Twitter because I wasn't sure what I was doing when I got there. When you go on a job interview, you are interviewing them. Do your homework. Be prepared to ask questions. Find out what makes them tick. Find out, look at their blog. Find out what their vision and values are. Ask them questions about it. Get smart about who you're going to meet with before you meet with them. You're going on an interview, but you're interviewing them to see if it's a good fit, to see if the role that they want you for makes sense for you. Please don't pick my brain, it hurts. Document everything that you're doing along the way so that you can show your process. It's not always gonna be useful all the time, but it will come in handy. And do it maybe at the end of every day. Like, I made this giant mess, click, save that. Save every little sketch. Take a picture of it. Snap it, whatever you wanna do. Just document it. Um, I love mail. I love a good thank you note. It's so surprising, it's so unexpected. It's a nice touch. It's pretty simple. Thanks.